Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Resurrection is like a slice of cake. I appreciate that phrase. It's probably going to require some explanation. I imagine one of the things that people are really missing in the current coronavirus crisis is being able to go out to a coffee shop with some friends. The last coffee shop I probably went to was the one at New Sid Abbey. When you stand at the counter there, you can see the various cakes that are on display. Now occasionally when cafes have their cakes on display like this, you might get one almost full cake on a platter with a single slice of a different cake completing the circle. Resurrection is like that single slice of cake surrounded by the rest. I'm guessing that what's happened in this instance usually is that the cafe has made two cakes. One is proving very popular, let's say a moist Victoria sponge, and now only one slice remains. Whereas the other one, let's say a coffee and walnut cake, has not gone down so well. In order to create space behind the counter, the person has moved a single slice of cake onto the other platter and in so doing has probably quite unwittingly created a picture of the resurrection. Now in order for this image to truly work, I need to suggest to you that the coffee and walnut cake, which I appreciate some strange people might actually like, needs in the picture to be replaced by something far worse. And I don't just mean a carrot cake. The sort of cake needed for the picture to work is a mouldy, rotting, rancid, infested cake alongside the slice of spongy goodness. You see, the deepest meanings of Easter are all about new beginnings, about new life. The resurrection is a slice of new life and goodness in the middle of our rotting, rancid world of de death and decay. Now keep that in the idea in mind as we hear John's account of that first Easter morning. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. 
Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. John's account of the resurrection starts with a crucial detail. It is the sort of thing that we can all too easily miss, but it is utterly crucial. He writes at the start of chapter 20, early on, on that first day of the week, whilst it was still dark. This is a new week. Yesterday has gone. This is a new beginning. And just in case we've not quite picked up on this the first time, he repeats this first day of the week designation later on in the passage in verse 19. For John, the events of this first Easter day, the events of this first day of this new week, are nothing less than a slice of the new world, a new beginning for all humanity. And this slice of this new beginning continues with the empty tomb. John has made it quite clear back at the end of the crucifixion story that yesterday Jesus' body was in the tomb. But now, on this new day, at the start of this new week, the tomb is empty. Even the little detail of the discarded grave clothes in the image, it's developed further, this idea of new beginnings. Jesus needed burial clothes yesterday, but not anymore. And in Mary's misunderstanding, initially thinking that the risen Christ was the gardener, in the conversation that follows, we see a new relationship forming between Jesus and his followers. Resurrection is a slice of the new heavens and the new earth that Jesus is building. In our rotten, broken world, we need to recognise that these will not be fully realised until Jesus returns. But this is utterly crucial to understand. The renewal has begun. It began when Jesus was raised from the old world of death and decay into a glorious hope and future. Our role as Christians is to keep creating new slices of resurrection cake. Now churches don't always take this as a metaphor, and that's okay, people like cake. But what is most important is that we in the church keep producing slices of new life and goodness in our lives and in our world. What might that look like at the moment? Well I know it is happening in all the phone calls that people are making to keep in touch with friends and family and especially with the more vulnerable people we know. Every time on a call someone replaces fear and loneliness with love and joy, another slice of resurrection goodness is shared. I know it's happening in the thousands of prayers that are offered for those who are hurting at this time, whether that's through the coronavirus or indeed other illnesses, which of course don't just go away. Every prayer offered is another slice of resurrection peace. I know it's happening when people do those simple things like picking up some shopping for their elderly neighbour. Every act of kindness is another slice of resurrection love that is shared. And I know that it's certainly happening in the dedication of the people serving in our hospitals and in other places of care who are carrying such a burden on behalf of us all. Every act of this service is another slice of resurrection hope for us all. One of the incredible consequences of this momentous day is that there is no situation in the world so terrible, no person so broken, that the risen Christ cannot transform them. That is why I have run with my resurrection slice of cake image when I might have been better advised to have come up with something else. But when we look at our world, the mouldy, rotting, rancid, infested world that is all too apparent today, the danger is that we think there is so much to do that we don't even know where to even start. But our task is not to create the whole of the new heavens and the new earth, that role belongs to Jesus. Our role is to keep sharing little slices of resurrection, love, joy, peace 
and hope. We can all do that. We can all do that because Jesus is risen and his mission is very much ongoing. Amen. our Father, by whose glory Christ was raised from the dead, strengthen us to walk with him in his risen life. Alleluia. May we go in joy and peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.